Thank you very much for that. Intro. Apologies for such a lengthy title to have to write in, but it sort of sums it up. I should add one little point to my bio. I am a mediator as well, and, uh, uh, but I specialize in one type of dispute, which is uh, between shareholders or people in business together, but I, I enjoy that separately. Um, this is a first. 20 years I've been giving talks on online dispute resolution and related topics. First time I've shared the stage with a grand piano. So you don't want me to play it. I think it was an old joke of um, a comedian that he, um, he told Andre Previn that he knows how to play all the right notes, just not in the right order. And that's a sort of extension of Nadja's analogy of the, of the, of the walker. Right, um, let me, uh, da, 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 da. first of all, um, mention the pleasure, really, for me in just coming back to uh, Vilnius. I was here uh, 2019 a couple of times, and just before I went away, I'd hear that my grandfather, my late grandfather, who I did know and who I'd always known was born in Rostov and Don, he'd actually lived and studied in Vilnius. I only found that out a couple of days before, so it's a, a real pleasure to come back here again. I should mention my Ukrainian flag here. I am doing some, have been doing some work for USAID on introducing ODR into the court systems in Ukraine, and in the last couple of weeks also invited to uh, advise the National Association of Labor Mediators in Ukraine on setting standards for mediation. Um, in fact, by the way, on online mediation, online dispute resolution, if you didn't know, there is a, already a lot of work being done on setting up a set of standards for online dispute resolution, which has been undertaken by the International Council of Online Dispute Resolution, icodr.org, if you want to take a look. I think standards are very important, but internationally, we've got to try and avoid uh, having a whole long list of bodies setting their own standards, obviously. And uh, the ICODA is trying to bring it all, all together there. Um, so, how AD, aid to mediation AR, and I just want to talk with some main points and thoughts that I see um, possibly the challenges where things can go a little bit wrong. And then, if I have time, Towards the end, I will actually show you some actual, highly advanced AI applications for dispute resolution and mediation, which are actually available at the moment, including a tournament that you can all um, get involved with if you wish. Uh, this is separate from the tournament going to be held here. So, uh, that doesn't change. That's not changing. Next. Shall I point it? Somewhere else there? Ah, it's gone. Um, how can it go wrong? I think it's very helpful if we all remember, before we get too carried away about using AI, first of all, what it is. I'm going to say something about that shortly. Um, but it does go wrong in a terribly, quite an extent. I have a couple of um, quick examples. There was a... Um, in China, in a town called Nangpo, they wanted to cut down on jaywalking, walking in the street. So they put cameras everywhere, and if they saw somebody in the street, they would use facial recognition to try and find who that person is. And if they did, they'd put signs all on the screens around the town saying, naming that person and saying that that person had been fined uh, to humiliate them and try and deter people from jaywalking. Turns out in one case, they got the wrong lady. Not only was she not jaywalking in the street, she wasn't even in the area at all. No, it wasn't the AI wrongly identifying who it was. They correctly identified the lady in question and find her. She wasn't there. What the cameras had seen was merely her face on an advert on the side of a bus. And so, if you think about that for a minute, that's not a failure of AI or facial recognition. It's a failure of the programmers setting the algorithms that said, if you see a face, try and identify. How about saying, 
check there's a body with the face as well. It's in 3D and it moves. So that's how things can go wrong and AI gets a wrong interpretation. In a more direct way in the justice system, there was the failures with the compass system in, uh, in the United States, which was available to courts all around in different states. And in this system, it was designed to help courts decide when they are punishing somebody for a, an offense of violence, whether they are likely to commit offense again within five years of being released from prison. And if the system decided they were at a high risk of committing an offense again, uh, then that might be an indication to the court to deal a little, little more harshly with them than they would otherwise. In other words, these were recidivists. Um, ProPublica organization did a very extensive study after the event, following up people who had been given sentences for five years or more and for violent offenses. They followed them up to see if they had indeed committed further offenses as the system the courts were buying to advise them was saying. It turned out, in fact, that no, 80%, four out of five of them who had been punished because they were considered to be recidivists and did it again, had not committed another offense in five years. So you could say, well, maybe the lengthier sentence had worked, but I'm inclined to think it's more likely to think the whole system and the algorithms are wrong. The whole thing with AI is, don't get too upset with it. Don't get too dismissive of it. Uh, it's all down to the humans. So what I want to now really uh, look at another subject related to this, how mandatory mediation go wrong. I'm looking, of course, I'm from England. I'm looking at the position in the courts of England and Wales um, and how it can actually go wrong. So what is about to be introduced uh, is a form of mandatory mediation for the small claims. That's claims up to £10,000 in value. Uh, they call this the small claims court. It's really the small claims track of the county court. And uh, lawyers are really not welcome. Uh, they're certainly not encouraged to be there. This is the court for litigants in person with claims up to £10,000. Uh, as an advantage to the litigant there to incentivize. Um, unlike in the other courts, the losing party does not have to pay the winning party any legal costs that they've incurred. So there's much more access to the, the case itself. I was part of a uh, Civil Justice Council working party that advised and helped develop uh, the online court, the online filing, and the processing. I have to say, many years on, I'm disappointed the courts in their online facilities are still restricted to not much more than the filing of a defense to a claim. But we're getting there. But the most interesting point that's now been announced by the government is that they're introducing mandatory mediation in this small claims track. It, I'm not quite sure the start time. It'll be soon. But the problem is, the word is there. People are going to be required to mediate and know not just about attending an information or management awareness, mediation awareness. They're going to be required to participate. So, so, so long as you, to the extent you can request people to come to stay. The problem is, the form of the mediation is so low value, is so limited, that I worry that this will, in fact, give a bad impression to the world out there of what mediation really is. This is a form of mediation that suits the objective. What is the objective? Well, since COVID, the courts, like everywhere, um, have been totally swamped with uh, cases in their backlist, in their waitlist. Apparently, some recent figures said that for a small claims case, which are very simple and straightforward, 
they are now taking over a year, over 52, I think, year, over 52 months, uh, week, sorry, to be dealt with. If it's a higher value, that goes up to 74 uh, weeks. That's totally unacceptable in the justice system. We do need justice to be reasonably swift. Um, and so the driver, the first problem is the driver to the Ministry of Justice, to the government, deciding to introduce mandatory mediation, I have to say after many years of rejecting it, has been purely to be able to speed up the handling of these cases. Not a great justice system rationale. Worse than that, despite there being a large, large numbers of people who have gone to one of the many accredited training courses in mediation, um, they are not using accredited mediators. They are going to be using um, court staff who are offered a slightly higher salary grade if they would take some in-house training in dealing with small claims cases. Uh, and so that's another worry about the quality of the mediation. Um, I have had personal experience for a niece of mine with a landlord dispute of what it was like under the existing voluntary mediation system run by the courts. But it's just a bit of shuttle diplomacy. You would, they would go to the landlord, are you prepared to offer some money to the tenant with the state of, um, would you, and then the tenant, would you accept that? And you're just going back and forth, juggling with money. It's not mediation as it should be. It's not really addressing the issues and why they are not, and helping people to come up with uh, brainstorming and all sorts of solutions and other things in other cases. No, uh, all that's going to happen is that this reasonably limitedly trained mediator will spend one hour, one hour, no matter how complex or simple the case is, and I think it's been said, just because the case is in the small claims court doesn't mean it's a simple claim. We can have just as equally complex problems that come within that. One hour is too limited. And worse than that, well, I suppose the only way they can do that um, the, is through the telephone. That's not the only way. I shouldn't say that. Online dispute resolution systems that gamify dispute resolution, which I will shortly show you to the extent that we have time, uh, but I'll show you how you can use it yourselves. Um, telephone, one-hour telephone mediation. So my concern about that, great, it gets people to know about the word mediation other than in the matrimonial context, because hitherto you speak to people, you say, do you know about mediation? And by and large, most people only know about it in the matrimonial family context, because that's where it's most common. Um, but it's going to give people, so now they will have an understanding, oh, it's something for small claims, but if they get involved in a more complicated, larger value claim, maybe they don't think, well, that mediation's not for that. That's just for simple things, isn't it? But they will worsen this. They may get a very poor understanding of one-hour mediation on the telephone, if that's what they think. So it's the image that these systems portray is a worry of how mandatory mediation can go wrong. And can I say how ODR, and I've put that in inverted commas for one special reason, how I believe ODR in mediation can go, why do I say that? I've been uh, researching, advising, developing, talking on ODR uh, for over 20 years. Why should I say it can go wrong in mediation? Well, it can. I, I remember doing a, a, um, a, a two-mediator, two-court trial in 2009 study, which, which is available somewhere on the internet, the actual written study of it. That was a very early trial. But how can it go wrong? Well, go back to the COVID, to the pandemic. Um, prior to that, it was a struggle to convince mediators to use online dispute resolution, online mediation techniques and alternatives that by then were being developed. But along comes the pandemic, and all of a sudden, everybody uh, discovers Zoom. And as the song goes, their heart went boom, and they became 
very much in love with Zoom. They could see that they didn't have to cease the mediation practice. Uh, they could carry it on um, with ODR. And that, that and everything to do with technology then with dispute resolution was called ODR, the handy acronym for it, Online Dispute Resolution. But that form of ODR, Zoom, a system not developed for mediation, but which happened to be people realized, oh, you could have breakout rooms. In fact, they, I think they developed the breakout rooms at the request of mediators. And so that was fine. Um, but it isn't a system, a safe or secure system, first of all, for many, for many a time after the pandemic started and lots of mediators worldwide started to use Zoom, um, it, was not, it did not have the uh, two-stage end-to-end encryption that they had promoted and advertised that they would have. They subsequently, after much complaining and publicity about it, eventually did give the end-to-end -end encryption. But another problem with it has occurred more recently. I don't know if anyone has heard of Otter AI. It's one of these many little apps that jump in to very well-known platforms like Zoom, Otter AI uh, can suddenly appear if you haven't told it to go away. Or, in a large organization, if you as a mediator realize the dangers, and I'll tell you about them in a second, um, if somebody else in your organization happened to allow Otter to be used within Zoom, what Otter does seems very good, it's, it is very powerful. After a meeting, it transcribes the whole meeting. So you have a meeting with someone, and there you have it all written down. How wonderful is that? But it then, what it then does, it doesn't send it just to the organizer. It sends it to everybody, whether they turned up at the meeting or not, if they were in the original invitation list when the Zoom meeting was set up. So think about that for a minute, of the horrors in mediation. You have given, you've signed confidentiality, that you say the private meetings, one-to-ones you have with both people, would be private to those people. But if Otter's in, lurking in the background, and if, let's say, this one of the people arrives very late or doesn't arrive at all, while you're in the Zoom with just one, you maybe feel you can talk privately to them about matters that you wouldn't yet do that. Uh, but me, Otter will go and send the whole transcript and breach yourself. So these are... Uh, <laughs> worries so much that I like to talk about TADR, Technology Assisted Dispute, and it, that Zoom is not ODR, as I like to call it. We can sit and argue it for as long as we know. But that's where it can get wrong. Yes, of course, because once the pandemic was over, I had lots of mediators who tell me, oh, thank God for that. Now we go back to real mediation. And of course, even mediation Zoom is still real. It still takes the same time. It still has the same process of mediation. Uh, it just does it online, but like you do everything online these days. So those are a few uh, mutterings of mine about where the interface between technology and mediation, we can discuss it or, or whatever. Uh, but which A do I, I, I really, for me, AI is not so much artificial, but augmented intelligence. And if I have a chance, some of the stuff I'm just briefly show you is exactly that. It's where technology cannot replace the mediator, but actually make the mediator more productive and make him do his work better in the sense of achieving resolution. So, a couple of things from a company that I advise called Smart Settle. Uh, they have two, uh, one and infinity. And one is what's otherwise known as blind bidding, you may have heard of, but that's where both parties know who's making offers, um, but doesn't know what the offers are. And at some stage, if various algorithms are satisfied, the system will announce a settlement. Uh, and often, and they've done a, a, a study recently in India, they found 62% of people were settling their cases just on the blind bidding alone. More cases when there was human intervention by mediators. Um, but this was, um, uh, this was because they eventually went, where it nu it's nudged technology, including encouraging people to go further, that they actually um, overlapped each other, and therefore any figure in there 
was something like that. Infinity is sort of the, almost the opposite, but it's a very much more complicated for multi multi-issue cases, multi-party, and that's where you know, you, you know what the offers are, but you don't know who's making them. So that's one where the machine learns about priorities of the parties from what the mediator tells it, and then can come up with package suggestions. So the other side doesn't suffer from, uh, I'm never going to, you know, from the bias of never accepting what the other party accepts. It, it removes the negotiating dance and bias. I'll have to do this very quickly. Um, uh, May I, uh, have I got a couple of minutes just to quickly? No, right, I won't be able to do it now. <laughs> but later on we will announce there is a access you all have to play with uh, the blind bidding system yourselves. And obviously I, I'm very happy to provide these slides, um, which are moving slides, so they show you how the process goes. Thank you very much.